brothers and sisters, welcome. Please join me in with me in a little praise song. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Lord has made, I will Welcome. Let me just pull that guitar off my head there for a second. Welcome, brothers and sisters. I, I know it's been a long time. It's been a long time uh, since I've uh, done a sermon. Uh, and that's because, like I, like I said on my last messages and things, I was reading over, we were reading over um, what I'm doing with the website and and uh, what I'm doing with, with getting everything ready for the, the August 21st, which is the first debut of... Uh, of uh, First Messianic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated. Now, um, what I said I was going to do, I am going to do. I'm I'm recording right now. Um, we're going to do First Corinthians eight, nine, and ten on Facebook Live and um, on Spreaker.com, which I would I would like y'all to go go ahead if you can go to Spreaker.com. Let those commercials play. Um, let those commercials play. But for, but for those of you, as we're growing, those of you who um, who like actual video and you want to see some different video than than uh, this video here on Facebook, I plan to do a video afterward about uh, on on Google Live uh, about uh, for profit and non profit. Okay, so let's get into to this. How we always get into it. I'm going to read my my Bible. I, we just sang a song. I'm going to read, uh, starting with uh, the Lord's Prayer, and uh, you know because I have some things I need to to do today. I, I apologize. I I kind of overslept. I had some plans to to do this earlier to in the day. It's now 5 p.m. I kind of overslept uh, because I, I work at night, and. Uh, and for those of you on video and on audio, I have uh, just a backboard. I'm still at my, my apartment, um, and uh, the people outside are, are mowing the lawn. If you hear that in the background, I'm hoping that my, my uh, air conditioner can kick in and try drown that noise out with, with uh, air conditioner noise. But you're going to hear something like that in the background. Hopefully, I'm coming through clear to you. Either way, I'm coming through clear to you, um, and uh, let's 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 just begin. Let's go ahead and begin. Uh, you know, I value your time and I value my time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and begin with with uh, doing First Corinthians uh, chapters eight, nine, and ten, which I have. It's been a long time coming, so let's begin reading the Lord's Prayer. Please join me in your favorite uh, version of the Bible. In um, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, says, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the food we need today. Forgive us what we've done wrong, as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. I always like to include verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. So now we're going to pray. Um, heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the sweet name of Jesus Christ, asking you to please lead and guide us as we go through 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10. Give us what, what 
you say we need spiritually, uh, mentally, and physically from these chapters. Let it not be our own understanding, but the wisdom, the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from up above by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to go into, uh, we're going to get go ahead and get into 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to be more, this particular one, because uh, I'm trying to be more considerate of your time. And of my time, between now and the 21st, I really do want to concentrate on getting. I don't want to overwork myself. I want to, I'm going to go ahead and let, let the Lord guide me. And I'm praying, pray for me as I, I pray for all of us that that, that, that takes place. That I don't um, get myself overwhelmed while trying to build these things. You know, just like what I said, what I said, what's going on in my life now. You know, I didn't think that... Uh, Personally, I, I knew something was going to come up, but I didn't think it would be that, uh, you know, dealing with uh, a change of ownership of the apartment I'm in, trying to, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be spending time doing that or spending time, any of my time between now and the 21st, uh, think even considering about moving into my own home and, and things of those natures. That's going to go on in the background, but, you know, according to the Word of God, according to the, like the book of Hot Hot Guy, um, uh, uh, you know, I still need to build first up on this ministry. I can't let anything, you know. And I'm praying for all of you to, add, you know, asking all of you pray for me. I, you know, we, we can't let anything get in the way of constructing this ministry because that's what I was doing. If it, if, um, if you know, the devil has tried to throw a wrench in the program by by trying to make me get me off focus. You know, I, I thank the Lord that is not working. I'm still going. I know that my life and my family's life is in the Lord's hands. And and uh, if I did, you know, I've repented. If I did, let let it get me thrown off track a little bit. Thank thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. But to God be the glory that I'm back on track to where I wanted to be. And here is not the 21st yet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that. OK, so now um, I'm going to go ahead and start reading. And for those of you who are listening, and if no one's listening right now because you can't listen right now, I pray that you listen to the archive and uh, and uh, get what you need out of out of that. Okay, um, brothers and sisters, we start in chapter eight. The Apostle Paul says, "Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that, as you say, we all have knowledge." Yes, that is so, but knowledge puffs up a person with pride, whereas love builds up a person. Okay, so the person who thinks he knows, and he has that in quotes, knows something, does not yet know in the way he ought to know. However, if someone loves God, God knows him. That's very important right there. Sometimes we we get to thinking that just because we have knowledge, those who've been living in, in the Word for a long time, sometimes we think because we have superior knowledge or, or we've been given and we've been through a lot of battles, we begin to um, sometimes uh, not consider the people who have just coming into the faith, you know, and we don't think about we don't think about where they are. We think about things and we speak of things in terms of where we are now. And we have, we've been doing it so long and everything. We have the faith that can move mountains, right? But we don't think about the people who just now just started, um, just came into to putting their faith in Christ. Sometimes we don't think about that. We have to repent about that. You know, we have to keep ourselves humble about that. Welcome, Tracy Williams. Welcome. Welcome to this this session. Please, if you can go to uh, Spreaker.com, uh, please go. But if not, stay stay right where you are. Um, so uh, we forget about that sometimes. I, I, I wanted to make that statement before we go in, even in further into reading chapter 8. We seasoned Christians, I, you know, is I guess is the word. We forget about that, and we need to con continue to keep ourselves humble. And, and recognize that new Christians coming in aren't 
at the same level of faith that we are. And we have to remind ourselves about that. We, we, sometimes we, we come across as, as looking down on new Christians. Um, and it's not that, that we are intentionally doing it, but sometimes we can un, unintentionally do that because we forget where God brought us from and how, how much of a struggle it was for us when we first came into the, to the fold. When we first came into the fold, you know, it wasn't so easy to obey God and put faith in him like we, we were supposed to. You know, we've had to go, on, go through some, we're still born again works in progress, yet we still have had to go through a lot of different experiences first to get to the level of faith in God's word that, that we have right now as seasoned Christians. And sometimes we forget that and we, and we get hard and unkind and seem to be unloving towards new Christians. Okay, so now back in verse four uh, of First Corinthians chapter eight, back in verse four. So as for eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that, as you say, an idol has no real existence in the world. And there is only one God. See, those of us who are seasoned Christians, we know this. For even if there are so-called gods, either in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are gods and lords galore, I'm in verse 6 now, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Yeshua or Jesus, right? The Messiah or Jesus Christ. Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, remember, I'm reading out a complete Jewish Bible. That's the Hebrew name, Hebrew Aramaic name for Jesus. It's Yeshua, the Messiah or Messiah, right? Okay, so through whom we are were created, through whom we were created, all things and through whom we have our being. Okay, then it says here, but not everyone has this knowledge. Moreover, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat food which has been sacrificed to them, they think of it as really affected by the idol. Now, I'm t I, I know we're reading about idol worship here, which is a good thing on the surface. But after I read this, we're going to bring it back up to, to 2018 some of the things that we can learn from this particular chapter about our attitude. And I think I just hit on it earlier about being those of us seasoned Christians staying humbled and, and trying to continue to be understanding toward those Christians who are just new, in, uh, newborn Christians in the faith um, on certain matters. That's what Paul is getting at here. You know, um, let me see. I'll go back to verse 7. But not everyone has this knowledge. Moreover, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat the food which has been sacrificed to them, they think of it as really affected by the idol. And their consciences, being weak, right, are thus defiled. He's talking about um, brothers and sisters in the faith that, that still, at this point in time in their life, they still... Haven't had, had the, the, they're not seasoned. Then they, they haven't had the time to really grow and their faith to really be strengthened to get away from those idols or those influences of those idols. Let's think about influences. Thank you, Lord. That's, that's a good word. Influences. You know, we've been influenced a lot. Even, even with seasoned Christians, whatever we were doing in the world has had some type of influence on us. And that is part of our struggle. Even though we, we know that we, we have the faith that, that the Lord is washing those things away from us and everything like that, that's exactly everything that you were doing and probably even some extra, every sinful thing that, and wicked thing that you were doing before you decided to surrender your life over to Christ, you know, the devil is still using those things and then some to tempt you back into a, a world of wickedness or a lifestyle of wickedness and unrighteous living. He does it to me. He does it to everybody, you know, whether we seasoned or new Christians or not. 
you know, you know, he 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 tries to do it. He tries to get us to be hypocrites. He tries to get, get us to do something after we've been living for the Lord for a while, and then he tries to push a button, you know, work through somebody to push a button, get us angry, get us off track, get us to acting like unfaithful uh, Christians or or like as if we've lost faith all of a sudden after all the things that God has brought us to as if we lost faith and 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 starting to trying to do it and accomplish things in our own strength you know so um I know you know that just came up as as I'm reading as I'm reading this you know like I said we we, we uh we having the Holy Spirit lead and guide me. I'm, you know, I pray that the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding me, and that what I'm saying to you is affecting you in your spirit. That it's not really me, but it's the Holy Spirit speaking through me. That's that's maybe bringing something up, up to you that you needed to hear, right? Because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I'm no better than anyone else. I'm no worse than anyone else when it comes to living for the Lord. You know. I, I have to remind myself to stay humble and we have to remind ourselves to stay humble and forgiving. Um, you know, all of us have to do that in order to stay right with, with the Lord and not step out of pocket, you know, step out in, into left field and start getting angry or, or upset or start doubting and all that kind of stuff. You know, when we stepped out the boat like Peter, we have to we have to keep ourselves in faith in order to continue to walk on that water no matter how stormy and, and wavy the water gets you know we have to keep our faith in christ in order to keep walking on that water no turning back right so um anyway he says here uh let's go to verse eight now food will not improve our relationship with god and and, and you know, interesting enough, I'm going to say that again. Now, food will not improve our relationship with God. So, I mean, uh, I have some friends immediately right away, and I know some brothers and sisters, what, what about kosher in, in the Old Testament? What about kosher foods? And, and what about eating right before the Lord and all that, and all of that stuff? And um, then Pastor Paul says here, right here in, in, in 1 Corinthians 8, food will not and I want to let y'all know that, you know, do you have faith that the word of God in the Holy Bible is telling you the truth? Why is he saying food will not improve my relationship with, with, with God? You know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of different religions and even Christians. Well, if you eat better foods, then, God, then, then you're obeying God. But if you eat these different foods over here, you're not obeying God. So, so what is it up with that? You know, it, um, we'll be talking about that. I'll be talking about that on some um, uh, Google Live videos that I will be putting on my, my video page as permanent permanent record, you know, because these Facebook, even if I put uh, on my Facebook page, it's only reaching to those of you on Facebook. But when I go to Google, there's some people that that are, are, are looking at my Google uh, uh, page that they don't have Facebook. So I'll, I'll, you know, be going back and forth, not necessarily speaking about the same same subject matter, but we'll be bringing these uh, these instances up. However, I've been encountering more people that you know um, that have been talking about that. I, as I go out and talk to people, they, they throw up the food, you know. And right here, First Corinthians chapter eight it is um, even though it's speaking about idols, it does bring that that issue up. And then you have also Romans chapter fourteen. Uh, that, that brings it up. And it's a, a couple of other places. You know, we remember when we went through Romans chapter 14, the first part of, of, of chapter 14 even talks about um, the issue with food over the issue of, of your, your brother's or sister's salvation, the issue of eating, whether you should eat kosher food or um, kosher food or uh, uh, um, non-kosher food. Matter of fact, I want to. I'll, I'll just flip back to Romans real quick. Romans chapter fourteen. I'm going to flip back there and read the first part that that deals with with food, and then I'll go back to reading chapter eight to refresh your memory. Or if you did not listen to my um, Romans when we walked through the book of Romans, if you have not listened to that, uh, I suggest that you would. You know, you can go on Spreaker.com. Um, Please go to Spreaker.com, listen to the audios. 
uh, for that is where we uh, we are uh, here at uh, at uh, Daryl's Dream Ministry and First Messianic Ministry of, of Nashville Incorporated. That's one area where we get our funding from. So that's why I'm asking y'all to do that. Uh, you know, um, and it's free to you. All you have to do is, is go there and listen. So uh, he, here he says in chapter 14 of Romans, I want to read this, the first part. Now, as for a person whose trust is weak, here again, it's, it's talking about weak faith or, or people who are new into the faith, right? He says, welcome him, but not to get into arguments, or welcome him, but, but not to get into arguments over opinions. One person has the trust or the faith that will allow him to eat anything. Here we go again. You know, he had to tell the Romans because people were you know, who are used to eating kosher food, you know, they were saying, well, you're not really saved if you're still going to eat unkosher food, you know, like the circumcision thing, you know, it, these things really don't have anything to do with salvation, spiritual salvation. The kosher food list in Leviticus is because when the Israelites were coming out of the desert, I mean, coming out of Egypt, excuse me, and into the desert, there are, and you know, I watch these animal shows. In that part of the world, there are animals that are toxic to, to human consumption that when you go to, if you eat them, but if you go to other parts of the world, like here in United States, waters or, or um, things, the, the, the fish here are not toxic. One of the things we have to remember is that the Israelites did not really know how to live and take care of themselves outside of being in someone's slave, a slave community. They didn't know how to take care of themselves. So God had to go back and uh, as they were going through the desert, re-educate them on what types of foods they should, you know, should be eating and should not be eating in that area. As they were going through the desert, as they got hungry or, or whatever, they should not eat these type of things because it would poison them. It would kill them, you know. Uh, it would make, it would do something to to the effect of where the person thought they were feeding their hunger, but then they were poisoning themselves. Uh, that's just the way God made it made it there. So that list, Leviticus list, and telling them not to eat anything unkosher was for that fact. They had toxins in them. The toxins might not necessarily kill you right away. It's like cigarettes, but but in the long run, it would do something to you to affect your your health and. and and your spiritual mentality and things of that, that nature. They had, there's things out there that, that cause hallucinogens and things of that nature. So, so God gave the Israelites a list, which is still valid because that part of the world has those particular uh, uh, food or substances that if you eat, um, even talking about the pigs and, and the, the camels and, and things of that nature, God did not create those particular animals for human consumption. You know, bada boom, bada bing. You know? <laughs> um, but there were plenty of people um, who were not of of a kosher background. They were not of a kosher background, and they were accustomed. And even in fact, they had an immune system to it because they were Gentiles. They're they're they lived there for so long, and their parent, their immune system, and everything was totally fine with it. You know. Um, there was things that they could eat that um, that the the Hebrews, because they had been living kosher for so long, simply could not eat. You know, and um, yes, it did affect their health also. It did affect their mentality also. But at the same time, they grew up on it. And sometimes, like just like I said, those of us who are seasoned Christians, sometimes we get impatient with the new Christians. Because they're doing things, they might be doing something, not just eating, but they might be doing something that we know is through our wisdom and through our experience is not good to continue to keep doing. But we have to learn how to pray for them and be patient. Let them know that eventually, you know, pray for them with the hope that eventually whatever it is that they're doing, eating or drinking or, or certain things that they might be doing that are not necessarily sins that would get you thrown into 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 uh 
condemnation. They don't, they don't condemn you, but it's still God's word, and it, and it is a benefit for you to get away from that stuff. You know, that's what we tell the younger, younger Christians. It's, a, it's still a benefit for you to get away from those things. And my, our hope and prayer is that they do. But, um, you know, sometimes, like I said, some of us are seasoned Christians and we go out of our way to try to tell somebody, which is not not 100 percent true. We, we go out of our way to try to tell somebody that these things like eating and drinking, unkosher food is is or um, sacrilegious unto God. And, and you're defiling the, the word and you're doing all of this stuff, which is which is something that they have. Those those are the things that they have to come to learn for themselves over time. Right. You know, what we should be concentrating on, if we're going to tell anybody about repentance, what we should be concentrating on is um, those things that that according to Revelations chapter 22, uh, verse 15 or First Corinthians six or something like that, something that will cause us not to have eternal life with Christ. We should be concentrating on those things and praying for our brothers and sisters about the things that that uh, are sinful unto God. Yet, like, like it says in 1 John chapter 5, there are some things that, that are sinful that lead to, to death, which is spiritual death and, and, and uh, condemnation in a sense. Even though we, I don't preach condemnation, we know that they're talking about condemnation in the Bible, right? We know that, that it speaks about that in our word. And then there are those things that are sins but do not lead to death. So, you know, we, ask to ask, we have to ask God for the wisdom. Those of us seasoned Christians, give us the wisdom to speak to the people about the things that, that they need to really repent from to be saved first. And then uh, we can, after, after that, we've accomplished that, then we can go back, go back and later on have discussions about, about those sins that are against God, that, 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 that God does not want us to do, but, but do not lead to death yet, you know, encourage our brothers and sisters to, to turn away from and repent from those sins as well because ultimately you're still disobeying God and that's not a good thing, right? All right, so getting back to uh, uh, Romans chapter, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you know, like I said, I want to, you know, read the Romans, read that first part of Romans yourself. So I was just trying to show you that, you know, it's still, you know, it still is talking about sort of the same thing here. Um, anyway, weak defiled. Let's see. Now, verse 9. So let me go back to verse 8. Now, food will not improve our relationship with God. We will be neither poorer if we abstain, nor richer if we eat. Right? Spiritually. He's talking spiritually here. We shall be physically poor if we eat those things. Like I just said, you know, that's medicinal. But we won't be spiritually any poorer or richer. All right? So then he says here, number nine, verse nine. However, watch out that your mastery of the situation does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Seasoned Christians, watch out. That our understanding about this and that our conviction about this is not causing problems for new Christians coming in who may have health concerns. You know, like, and let me say, state right now, I'm not telling somebody if you know, if you already know that like, you're a diabetic or you have a heart condition or something like that, it, it is wise to stick to kosher foods and, and uh, stick to the diet that, that, um, uh, your doctor gave you okay that's obvious you know that's obvious but see that still has nothing to do with salvation you know that, that has something to do with your health you know and that your body being God's temple your physical body on this earth being God's temple want to take the best care of it that you you should be taking be simply because you know you're honoring God right so um, that's wisdom he says here Verse 9, again, uh, excuse me, verse 10. You have this knowledge, those of us seasoned Christians, we have this knowledge, but suppose someone with a weak conscience, a new, newly born Christian, right, sees you sitting, eating a meal in the temple of an idol. I know this is talking about idol worship, 
But still, today, like I said, bringing it up to 2018, sees you eating, let's say, pork or um, shellfish or something like that, you know, that the, that the Bible says, that Leviticus chapter 11 says, should not be, be eaten, should not be consumed. But they see you eating that stuff, right? And not necessarily to an idol, but that you're eating those things. Right? Eating in the temple of in the temple of an idol. You know? Let's just say, oh, like a restaurant. They see you at the crab shack. <laughs> you know, <laughs> chopping away on them crabs, you know, and, and them crawfish and them king king prawns, whatever you're gonna eat there. It says, uh, won't he be built up wrongly to eat this food which has been sacrificed to idols? You know, thus by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. This brother for whom the Messiah died. And so when you sin against the brothers by wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you are sinning against the Messiah. Right. Then he says to sum up, if food will be a snare for my brother, I will never eat meat again. I will never eat meat again. That's what he said. Lest I cause my brother to sin. And this is going in relations with uh, uh, Romans chapter 14. The thing about it is this. He's, Pastor Paul is saying this. If we're doing something because we're seasoned Christians and we know that is not. God has no, no problem with it because we're seasoned Christians. So God doesn't have a problem with that. Yet somebody who is not seasoned, who, who in their heart and mind feels that. Whatever it is that we're doing or is um uh, is is uh is a, a contradictory or conflict of interest in, in, in living the right life for the Lord, you know, we have to be remember to be sensitive about that. We have to remember to pray about that. I'm not saying and Paul is not saying necessarily that what you're doing is, is now wrong, but let's be considerate, let's be, you know. Romans chapter, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, be considerate about the new brothers and sisters coming in. It, it would be best, and like according to Romans chapter chapter uh, 14, sometimes certain things you do, whether it's eating or drinking, whether it's something else that you know, you have this knowledge that is, is not really a sin before the Lord, it's sometimes best not done, you know, just to be conscious of that and don't do certain things in front of uh, unseasoned or, or or new Christians that would cause them confusion, that would cause them to, to be confused about uh, what it means to live for the Lord, you know. So then he says there, you know, I will never eat meat again. It's not going to kill me to stop eating something, uh, to stick to the kosher diet. It's not going to kill any of us to do that in order for that young Christians coming in or people who, who are very sensitive about that, it's not going to kill me to stop eating meat, you know. But as we see in, in Romans chapter 14, at the same time, you know, don't let people start preaching that type of Christianity as if it, it's a sin, a, a damnable, damnable, condemnable sin against God, you know. That if you don't stop eating meat, you know, as some other religions say, if you don't stop eating that pork, you're going to go to hell. You know, and there's no no indication in the in the Bible about that. You know, disobedience unto God does cause things. You know, let's let's think about that. How that consumption of pork is unhealthy for us. We know that on a lot of medical levels, it's unhealthy for us to eat. But some people have been brought up on it, and and you know, we can pray, but we know that you know. Just like they said here, if their faith is weak in that area, they're not going to stop eating that overnight just because they learn, you know, like I said, everything in the Bible, we don't stop. If we're going to be honest, we don't stop doing everything the first time we hear that is wrong. We don't, you know, it takes prayer. It takes fasting, you know, fasting away from eating certain things. You know, it takes, takes that just like Jesus said, it takes that for us to get to that level. You know, it takes an effort on our part. Everything is not just the Holy Spirit come down and wash everything away. There's, it takes an effort on our part to do some things also. 
You know, God, God is, you know, cleaning us on the inside spiritually. But we have to show him also that we're, we're willing to live the life that he called us to live in areas like that. And then the next thing, I'm going into um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 as we go into it. The big thing, you know, uh, I was just talking to, to a, a brother at my church about the Messiah ministry. And when I mentioned to him, like I, I've told y'all before, when I mentioned to him that we're for profit, you know, we're for profit and not non-profit, you know, uh, he immediately, because of his understanding and lack of understanding, and, and, and it goes into with 1 Corinthians chapter 8, because of my knowledge, I know that for profit, non profit, all of that stuff has to do with the government. Because of my education, that has to do with government. That has to do with giving Caesar unto Caesar. Being a for profit uh, ministry or a non profit church, 501c3, a lot of us have been miseducated about that. You know, there is no scripture in the Bible that says if you decide to be, think about Chick fil A or a, a Christian, for profit Christian industry like Chick fil A. There is no scripture in the Bible that says if you choose to be a for-profit, preach the word under a for-profit uh, entity rather than non-profit, that you're disobeying God somehow. You know, that's that's not what a non not-for-profit, you know, he said, he stated to me, which I know a lot of people state, he says, well, we're non-profit because we're not making, we're not doing this for money. And, you know, my knowledge is, and I didn't get an argument with him or anything, but, you know, my knowledge, of course, because the, the knowledge that God gave me, first of all, God told me to go for profit, right? But my knowledge also, the knowledge that I acquired over the years to come to understand something, nonprofit organizations, 501c3, is a business in the eyes of the government. That's why churches, Christian churches, other religious affiliates, and even things like Salvation Army and all of that can claim, and a lot of televangelists, you can claim nonprofit status, which makes you exempt on your taxes that you give to Caesar or give to the government each year. That has nothing to do, you know, with preaching the word of God or living for the Lord. That has nothing to do with that. Only thing that has to do with it is Jesus told us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. And if we're going to live in any nation, we need to obey the laws of the land so long as those laws are not, are not in conflict with the word of God. That's, that's what we're, we know we're supposed to do. Being a for-profit entity rather than a non-profit entity is just giving uh, the money that you collect because if you're a non-profit, you say you're a non-profit organization, you're not doing it for the money, but... Every Sunday when, when you pass those tithes over to the collection plate, a, por a big portion of that is, is regulated by Congress. Uh, every time you, you, uh, your church has a fundraiser, you're doing that that way simply because, and, and the things that the church wants to do, you're doing it that way simply because a 501c3 entity de 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 determines uh, that that's how you're supposed to, under that, that particular entity, that's how you're supposed to conduct business when it has to do with the money. It doesn't have to do with salvation. You know, in obeying the laws of the land, every everything, entity, whatever, you have to declare yourself to Congress as something. All right? Now, being for profit, for profit pretty much just means that the money... Um, and your ability to do certain things in your community or in your society, a for-profit um, incorporation or a benefit corporation or corporations in general, um, the purpose is, you know, uh, to do something to acquire commercial, residential, which means low-income housing, commercial real estate, which is like businesses, create jobs. Create jobs for people so that people can have have work, uh, have an income, and do their taxes. Okay, 
Now, the big confusion is here. A lot of people say, well, you know, if you're Christian, you need to stay poor. Okay, well, that that is not true. Jesus did say the poor you have with you always, but we do not have to stay poor. The thing about being being wealthy or having a lot of money is that those particular Christians have to be careful not to become greedy. Right. But in society that we live in, there is nothing wrong with those of us having our own business or investing money. As long as we know we're educated, we know what we're supposed to do. We're obeying the Lord. We're still living for the Lord. It doesn't make make much of a difference. Now, the thing about about a for profit industry, that's where Congress and this the United States government or any any nation is looking for people, small business. You hear the, the people say that. Small business, you know, is necessary. We need to have people getting into business for themselves because that is where people create, create, um, where this country creates most of its jobs. Once you start doing taxes for the IRS and things of that nature, um, that's what the IRS wants. The, the, I mean, Congress wants. The government does not like homelessness. And so, for-profit industries are designed to build, if you wanted to, people invest their money to create low-income housing. That's what it was originally for. I know there's a lot of questions out there, right? Excuse me. Excuse me. Right now, um, sorry about that. Right now, they, they, uh, they seem to be like focused only on rich or people who have money. That is the, the, the thing that... that the Bible warns about people who are wealthy. We got to be careful not to, uh, you know, you, you got to be careful not to l allow that to happen because the money and everything you do is really supposed to be going in for helping the people. So um, that's pretty much just it. It's, it's giving to uh, Congress under a different set of rules, giving uh, your taxes under a different set of rules that during the tax year, it allows you to do different things. You know, so um, like a nonprofit organization, which is good. I'm not saying anything bad about it, but but don't fool yourself into thinking that you're not in business because that's according to in the eyes of, of Congress. That's what you're doing. The, the gospel preaching the gospel, whether you're nonprofit or for profit, should be free. Right. You know, it's free. You know, you're telling the people if you're a preacher, pastor or anything, you're telling people God's word. You want them to be saved. You want them to have eternal life. You know, but do not mix that up with with the things that you do. Let your congregations know. You know, one of the things I didn't I wasn't upset at him and I'm not upset at anybody. But one of the things I, I, I often wonder is why so many nonprofit organization churches, 501c3 churches, why you don't have a, a way of, you know, the church that I'm, I'm attending right now. They do sit us down and, and um, go. We go over the bylaws and things of that nature. But even even there, why is there no place where we, we can sit down and the, and most people, most uh, minorities and people living in poverty are not learning about we are not learning about these things. That's why my secondary mission is to is to teach about these things. So um, and here, as we go into first uh, Corinthians, chapter nine, um, I'm going to. You know, this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Um, to get back into the focus of the lesson, you know, people say, well, you know, should we be making money off the gospel? Should we not? And right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that's what Paul is speaking about. Now, as we, we read, I hope you're there with me in your favorite Bible, in your favorite version of the Bible. He says here, verse 1, am I not a free man? Am I not an emissary of the Messiah or an apostle of, of Christ? Haven't I seen Yeshua, our Lord? Referring to his road to Damascus experience. And aren't you yourselves the result of my work for the Lord? Even if, if to others I am not an emissary, at least I am to you. For you are living proof that I am the Lord's emissary. Right. Verse three, that is my defense when people put me under examination. 
And he's talking about, you know, they looking at him. Are you trying, you just trying to preach to make money or whatever, to the, you know, down the line. All right. It says here, uh, don't we have, verse four, don't we have the right to be given food and drink? Don't we have the right to take along with us a believing wife as do the other emissaries, also the Lord's brother and Kepha? That's Peter. These are questions. Or are Barnabas and I the only ones required to go on working for our living? Okay. Did you ever hear, here's where we're getting into it. Did you ever hear of a soldier paying his own expenses? Right? Or of a farmer planting a vineyard without eating its grapes? Then he asks another question. Who shepherds a flock without drinking some of the milk? What I am saying is not based merely on human authority. Here we go. Because the Torah says the same thing. For in the Torah of Moses, of Moshe, it is written, you are not to put a muzzle on an ox when it's treading out the grain. That means while the ox is, is, is plowing the fields, if the ox get hungry and wants to eat some of the, <laughs> some of the, some of the uh, grass that is plowing or whatever, let the ox go ahead and take a break and eat, right? Right? Don't stick a muzzle on the ox and say, tell the ox, you, you plow the field, but you can't have none of this while you plowing. You can't, if you get hungry, you got to wait until after, wait until after you plow the field and everything and the hot, the ox is hungry and thirsty. That ox ain't going to do everything for you. That ox get thirsty. That ox ain't going nowhere straight to the water to get, a, get a, at least something to, to drink. Or, um, or if the, that ox is hungry and needs to eat, it's going to go eat some grass. It ain't, it's going to take its own break. And, and that big old ox, when it get ready to take its break, you know, you sticking a muzzle on that ox, that ox ain't going to do nothing for you anymore, right? So anyway, he says here, you know, God gave me that too. You know, <laughs> just gave me that too. So um, back in verse 9, if God is concerned about cattle, all the more does he say this for, I have to turn my page. I'm sorry. I got to turn my page. All the more does he say this for our sakes. We're human beings. We need to take a break. We need to eat, drink. You know, whatever job we're doing, right? We need to take a break and eat and drink. We have a right for that. He says, yes, it was written for us. Meaning, I mean, I'm in verse 10. Meaning that he who plows and he who threshes should work expecting to get a share of the crop. In other words, you should be getting paid for what for for, pre, for preaching. And do, don't ministers in the nonprofit organization, y'all get a salary, don't you? You know, or whatever you're doing in the church, it it does lead to some type of financial income. So it's still a business, you know. When when, it, when we're talking about this side of the field, you have to have some type of income to pay you pay the government to keep a roof over your head, to keep your electric lights on and to, to pay for anything. You have to do that. Right now, now people out in the world who will say, well, I never heard of, of, uh, of people. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about, about making money off the gospel. Yes, it does. We're reading it right now. <laughs> you know, yes, it does. But we have, like I said earlier, we have to be careful. Right? Not living outside of our means. So he says here, um, verse 11, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If Is it too, too bad to reap some money from you for, for, for doing the work of the Lord? Like as, as uh, this, this young man that I talked to and a lot of people saying, they, they tell themselves, we're doing it for nonprofit organization. We're not doing it for money. Yes, you are. Okay, you're doing it for money. Yes, you are. Because every time, every time you turn around, y'all asking people to, to 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 give money for something. 
in order to, to build up the church, in order to pay the lights and to pay the, the people who worked in the church. You know, it's the same thing, you know, ex except for uh, it just comes out differently if you're for profit. Like I said, for profits concentrate more on acquiring real estate and creating jobs. You know, as, as far as nonprofit organizations, that's where a lot of the ministry work, which I, I'm not saying is wrong, a lot of the, the Christian ministry work doing, you know, feeding the homeless, helping the, helping the poor, giving them food to eat, you know, uh, on and on down the line of that nature, helping people in, in disaster areas and things of that nature. Yes, give. That's, that's why the nonprofit organization is there. You're giving without receive, expecting to receive anything in return. But that does not mean as Christians we can't establish for-profit industries where we're investing our money, expecting a return on our investment in order to, for us to live better lives and to be able to provide, like I said, jobs for people who are jobless right now. You know, one of the things that I, that I, that I, I always speak about is that those of us who are, are under nonprofit organization, when we go to the, when we, when people come out of prison or when you have these women working these strip joints and things like that, and you share with them about coming and living their life for Christ, you know, and when they get out of prison, they have no, no one wants to hire them. You know, the first thing, where are they going to get, get an income from, you know, uh, these, um, strippers or whatever, whatever they're doing, if they were prostituting, whatever. We're telling them to turn away from that wicked way, way of life and come on into the fold and trust God. Yes, but it should also be that we, we, we're able, we should be able to say we also have income. For, we have employment for you that, that you don't have to go out there. You know, if you were a former prisoner, we will hire you. You know, we should have a place. We can hire you to work in within the ministry, this for-profit ministry, to work within this ministry so that you won't be tempted to go back out there and steal because no one wants to hire you and steal and get yourself put back in prison again. So you won't, you know, if, if you came away from strip joints and all that kind of stuff, so that you won't go back there to, to, to feed yourself and your children or whatever, single mothers or whatever, whatever the situation might be, so that you won't go back there, there needs to be a place where you can go get a job. You can go get hired, at least start building a, a, a savory righteous income so this is probably most likely why the lord told me to go for profit there needs to be more for, for profit christian industry you know that that's a, a false understanding of uh well i have to be non-profit or i have to be doing this i can't make money just right here you know you can just look right here the apostle paul is talking about that right here first corinthians 9 1 Corinthians chapter 9, for everybody that, that you think it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that you, you can or cannot make money off of preaching the word. Yes, you can. Now, you got to be careful because at the same time, and I'm not naming any names, I'm just giving this as an example. At the same time, and, and there's not only one televangelist that's done this. There's more than one. Who've, who've asked for things like airplanes and all of those kind of things. Like I said, I'm not judging or prejudging or anything like that, but it just, you know, you have to be careful. Even if you're a local preacher, pastor, or whatever, you got to be careful. If, if your only source of income is from uh, preaching the ministry and you're telling people to be considerate and, and, uh, about people in poverty and things of that nature, you know, then it, it is only right. It is, I think it's wise and it's right that your, your standard of living should not be so, so exceeding, you know, riding around in, in, in a Bentley and, and, and having the finest clothing and these big mansions and everything that you live in while some of the people in your own congregation are still poor. You know, so you got to be careful about that. That that That's also what Paul is getting to in here. And we'll, we'll see that in, in, as we read. So he says here, verse 11, If we have sown spiritual seed among you, 
Is it too much we reap a material harvest from you? Verse 12, if others are sharing in this right to be supported by you, don't we have a greater claim to it? Being that they're apostles, you know, that's what he was saying. Now, but we do not make use of this right. In other words, Paul is saying right here, I still choose. He was a tent. To my knowledge, he was a tent maker. And what he's getting into right now, he's saying for himself and Barnabas, they've chosen to continue to have some other form of employment because they know. Remember, chapter 8 just talked about not being a stumbling block for, for people who are weak. Well, they know that people want to serve the Lord, are new Christians, newly born Christians. They knew way, way back 2000, over 2,000 years ago that some people might feel when, and then, that the devil would try to use that to get people to, to, to start saying things like, oh, those Christians over there are just in it for the money. They don't really care about me. Uh, they just want to take your money. They don't want to give anything back. Blah, 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 on down the line. Since I'm on that note, one of the other things about a, a, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and I'm going to keep mentioning it, according to the rules and regulations of Congress, you see, this is not Bible. When you go and ask them for, for money, if a person you were in need and you went to ask your church or whatever for, for money, um, you do need to understand that, that by law, by, and, and being in obedience to the nonprofit organization uh, situation, in order to keep their status as a nonprofit organization, the government does not, uh, Congress does not allow them to give you as an individual more than, let's say, uh, $500. And if you should happen to be in more need of that more uh, more of a need of uh, more than $500 then it's up to you to, to go to other churches that you're not familiar with to get that money or you know make the rest of what you need through other means that's not church that's not biblical that's Congress that's the law of the United States and those churches and pastors are abiding by the laws and the regulations like they're supposed to they're they're obeying caesar according to to when it comes to the money now my concern is what i just told you i don't understand why why many many churches out there don't explain want to explain that to you you know and to to the public and then you got people who are christians but then they're hurt then they're confused and they're angry I went down to that church. I've been giving my tithe to that church all this time. And, and when I needed money, all they could give me was, was a little bit. I needed a whole bunch more. I needed $2,000, for example. But all they gave me was 500 After all this time I've been giving this to the church, that's because they're not allowed to give one individual more than that. They would be violating their laws, the laws or their, their thing. When they go to do their taxes, the IRS... Um, would look at that like, hey, you gave that person more than more than the, re the required, the allowed amount. Why did you do that? Is there some type of embezzlement, money laundering going on here? Are you doing something corrupt? That's the first thing that the uh, that the IRS is going to start investigating. They call it an audit. They're going to go look into that um, because the church, being under five hundred one c three nonprofit rules did not obey the rules and they, they went out of their way to do something for that one individual and it can see, can, it, can appear corrupt. Now their whole 501c entity is in jeopardy because they did that one thing for that one, one Christian brother or sister who did not understand that the reason why they could only give 500. On that note, things like that is also why there should be more I should not be the only one. There should be more for-profit entity ministries um, out there. The reason being is because under the for-profit uh, for-profit incorporation rules, and you know, there's other things. We still have to. We have our own set of rules to abide by. The government Caesar is, is always going to make sure ain't nobody doing nothing corrupt. But under a different set of rules, 
certain things can be given a certain way. Like I said, when we raise the money, our money is an, is an investment to acquiring low-income housing, to acquiring uh, commercial places, commercial real estate, where we can create jobs to employ people. That's where a for-profit has to prove that every, everything that they're doing is for that purpose. Now, isn't it ironic that the churches want to do this for the people, but under the laws of a 501c3, they cannot. So then, so then to collect money and to keep going financial-wise, the church has a lot of different things. Oh, a fund drive. Let's, let's help the people over in another country uh, uh, get money. Let's help the people over here. Let's help the homeless and do all those kind of things because that's, that's what the government allows the, a nonprofit organization to do. And so that's why when they collect money, but, but you say, a lot of people say, which is true, you say, well, we've been giving money, we've been helping the poor and all that stuff, but it doesn't seem to be improving the situation. The reason why it's not improving the situation is because under a for-profit entity is where you can put your money together, you can put an investment together, you can do things to buy houses, buy, buy land, create houses, build houses and all that. I know about Habitat for Humanity and all that stuff, but even then, uh, because they're a nonprofit organization, when you go and apply to try to get a house or something like that, you say like you're poor, you need a house, you have to go through, you have to apply, you have to go through all of this red tape, you have to go through all of this stuff that, that is required for you to go to just for one person to, to, to be approved to get that house or to get that whatever it is that you need to, 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 to continue to survive off of. That's just the way everything is set up. So therefore, there is a need for more people. I'm not saying we should, we, I, I did not say that we should totally get, a, get rid of nonprofit organization churches. No. They are there. God has, you are established. You do fulfill a purpose for the Lord and for the, your community. I'm just saying that, that we have enough already nonprofit churches. We have enough nonprofit organizations out there. Now it's time for us, especially low income communities, to start having for profit corporation industry. Who is it that's kicking you out of, out of your your apartments and out of your places to live. Who is it that's gentrifying you? It's usually for for profit communities. Why? And why does the government let that happen? Because the government don't want. If you're not out there building houses, building people places for people to live, if you're not out there creating jobs, the government, you know, God might want to hear from you all day, but the government don't care about what's going on. That's that's just the world we live in. They don't care. They, they're going to tell you, get out the way, let's make room for the people who are making money for us. That's what they think about. And yes, that's true. Those of us who are Christians ought to be able to, able to understand, hey, we need to be, we the ones that we want to do things right for the Lord. We want to, we want to make sure that as these corporations are being built up, people are not being thrown out on the street. People are not being homeless. What best way to do that then is to become a, a for-profit corporation so that, so that you can acquire the finances to go buy the land and make sure that those peop people have a place to live. You know, the Bible says you will always have the poor, but it does not say you will always have homeless people. That's where we get the con con confusion. You know, some, some of us, well, you're going to always have homeless. No, you're going to always have poor people. That doesn't mean they, they, they should be living out on the street in the cold weather. Right? Talking about kindness there, Elizabeth. Welcome. Talking about kindness is very unkind to have that assumption. Well, well I, you know, we, we don't have to, we, we're not responsible for, for, for making sure that people have a place to live. Yes, we are. And if we're going to do it right and you're going to do it legally, Right? For American citizens to have a place to live, some of us need to be for-profit industries so that we can create the jobs so people can, first of all, have income. 
so that they can pay rent in the first place, have a decent income, not no low minimum wage income where they really can't afford to have a place to live, but we should be able to create decent income for people so that people can have a place to live and can afford the rent or um, uh, afford the rent or, or buy a new home. People should be able to afford that. You know, are we going to make great changes? Well, that's up to the Lord. But it should, it should exist. Anyway, as I read further, right? As I'm reading further, it's 6.15. I'm trying to <laughs> keep myself, you know, I, like I said, I have to talk about some other things on, on Google Live after this. Uh, so uh, it says here, 12, verse 12 in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. If others are sharing this right, it'd be, okay, uh, sharing this right to be supported by you, don't we have a greater claim to it? Now, but we don't make use of this right. Rather, we put up with all kinds of things so as not to impede in any way the good news about the Messiah. Like I just said, we've chosen, Paul and Barnabas chose to keep a, a job. You know, and one of the things about that is because I have, I have work and I also have uh, investments that I share with you, you know, the, um, the uh, legal shield and then also trading on the foreign exchange. And then also I'm still working on the um, carrot goal. I, I'm, I'm waiting for some things to happen so I can work on that. Those are investments and business opportunities and things of that nature. I choose to keep. Why? I'm not going to put, be putting too much focus on it. I, you know, I'm, I want to focus on getting you saved and everything. But just like Paul here, I have other, other means of income. Where that helps me, and I see the wisdom in doing that, is because when I was talking about those pastors who compromise the word of God and don't want to speak about certain things, don't want to call, for example, you do not want to call fornicators to stop fornicating. You do not want to call or even bring up that homosexuals still need to turn away from their homosexuality and you've made ways in your churches for them to, to continue to exist in that state of state of sin. A lot of times it's because since that's your only source of income, you don't want to say anything. You don't want to rock the boat, as we call it. You don't want to say anything that's going to cause a good chunk of your congregation to leave uh, in which, which eventually means you're not going to be making as much money off the gospel as you were. And since that's your only source of income, you have no investments, you have no uh, employment anywhere else, the, temp the temptation for you to do that, pastors, preachers, or whatever, the temptation for you to do that is much more greater than it is for me. You know, to start doing that, start allowing that. I, on the other hand, like I took Pastor Paul's lead, I, as long as I'm physically able and mentally able to have a job, I choose to have a job on the side. You know, now I'm saying physically and mentally able to, cause, because as this ministry grows, being that is for profit, that's, that's even another thing. As this ministry grows, I may have to shift a lot of my time into doing something for a profit, which is still an investment is still an asset, right? Uh, in order to, to, to administer and everything. But I, I'm hoping and praying that more people come in to do it with me. You know, once we take this offline, you know, for the for-profit, uh, for the first Messianic ministry of Nashville Incorporated, and once we have an actual building, it's not only going to be me. I need to pray that I'm able, that we're capable of, of employing people to keep the thing running. And therefore, that would be our first place to, to acquire real estate and create jobs, create an income for people so that they, they can't go, they, they can get up off the unemployment lines. And you know, working for the ministry, here's another thing that y'all don't realize as a for profit minister, when, when we get to that point, ministry, when we get to that point where we can hire people, people do not necessarily gonna, are not necessarily going to have to have a PhD or some other college degree. There's a lot of people out there that they have college degrees, they're homeless, you know, for other reasons. But then there's a lot of people out there, still out there, who um, 
are not college material and they should not be suffering uh, with low income wages and all this other kind of stuff on the verge of being homeless just because they um, are not uh, that intelligent enough to have had a degree or they, they don't have a degree or college degree. They didn't finish school for whatever reason. They should, they should be placed out on the street and punished for the rest of their life because they didn't have the opportunities that some of you, some of us who went to college had. That's another thing that, that people don't think about. But the Lord told me to think about that. That's another thing why we need to have more for-profit industries, you know, and, and, and doing things where we're hiring people. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to work in the, in the ministry. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to do that. But then you should also be getting paid enough money to make a living. Now, on top of that, besides that, since you're working, for, you will be working for the Lord. Did not Jesus take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed 5,000 people with it? All right. So we, we need to see these miracles happening and they can happen. All right. So um, anyway, let me get back to to reading this. So he says here. And, and what I was saying, too, is that because of that, I can preach the full gospel. I can preach about where the Bible says, if we're living a certain lifestyle, we need to change. I'm not worried about my income. I, I Blessed, thank the Lord that I have income coming from someplace else where I don't have to personally struggle with that. Well, I'm not going to preach about this subject because I'm afraid people are going to stop giving me money. It ain't about that. It ain't about that at all. So your salvation, like I said, is more important to me and to you than how much money I'm making off of this. That's that's more important. See, so I have other sources of income. I don't have to depend on preaching or, or twist the word or, or, or lie to you or preach falsehood or neglect to preach about something just because I'm concerned about you not giving me no money. You know, and, and Apostle Paul, he, that's what he's talking about here, too. He says, now let's get that to verse 13. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrifices offered there? If you're preaching or something like that, you're supposed to be getting some some type of, of income from that financial income from it. Right. In the same way, the Lord directed that those who proclaim the good news should get their living from the good news. I know there's a lot of people out there. I saw somebody, a news clip. This is a young lady said, oh, the church should not be taking money for it. It said right here, yes, you can. Yes, yes, the people can. We know that people have abused this. And, and Paul is talking about that. And, and, you know, this was written 2,000 years ago. So people were abusing it back then also. You know, verse 15. But I have not made use of any of these rights, nor am I writing now to secure them for myself. He said, I'm not about to try to secure anything for myself. For I would rather die than be deprived of my grounding ground for boasting. I'd rather die than to, than, you know, than to, you know, say that I know I'm making all my money off the gospel in a sense. You know, I, he'd rather die. He'd rather keep working and building tents as long as he can make, make and build those tents. Well, we know Paul got captured and beheaded, right? We know, we know he got, he was murdered. But um, while he was going around preaching the word, he always kept the job. That's basically what he's saying here. Verse 16, for I cannot boast, wait a minute, for I cannot boast merely because I proclaim the good news, right? That's free. Telling you that Jesus loves you and he wants you to be saved, that's free. Even for the nonprofit churches, that's free. So what's the money for, <laughs> right? I do this from inner compulsion. Woe to me if I do not claim, proclaim the good news. He's doing, he's preaching gospel about Jesus Christ because he loved the Lord. The Lord saved him. The Lord stopped him when he was out killing Christians and, and turned him around to become 
an apostle. So he's saying, I'm doing it out of my, the kindness of my heart. Yes, that's right. But it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible. That's what I'm trying to tell y'all. I'm still, even if I'm a for-profit minister, I'm not, I'm still doing it out of the, out of my heart to want to do this for the Lord. This had nothing to do with I'm preaching for money. But the same thing for everybody that you're doing it under non-profit organizations. Shouldn't you be preaching from your heart? Jesus did, saved you. Therefore, you want others to be saved. There's no money in that. So why all the money? Because we know we need money in this world. We need the money to pay, pay our bills. To go buy food in the grocery store. Pay for our health, buy our clothes, right? Pay for, for gas for our cars and shoes. We all do it. All, and that's where the money's going. That should be going. All right. So anyway, so he says here, uh, I do it willingly. Okay, wait a minute. Compulsion. Woe. Woe to me if I do not proclaim the good news. Verse 17. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if I do it unwillingly, I still do it. Simply because I've been entrusted with a job. J-O-B. So then, verse 18, what is my reward? Just this. In that proclaiming the good news, I can make it available free of charge without making use of the rights to which it entitles me. And he's saying, I'm going to keep making tents so that when I preach, can't nobody come, can't somebody come back around and say, he just preaching for the money. He just trying to take my money. In a sense, that's what Paul is saying here. Everybody knows I got a job. You know, so when I preach the gospel to you, I'm preaching out of my heart. I'm preaching because I'm concerned about your salvation. It ain't it ain't about financial gain. You know. Preaching the word that is encouraging you to put your faith in Christ. That's not about financial gain. What what does financial gain do for eternal life? How can that be more important than eternal life? Right. So he says here with the job. So then, well, what is my reward? Okay. Just now, I make an entitled me. Verse 19. For although I am a free man, not bound to do anyone's bidding, I have made myself a slave in order to win as many people as possible. Right? To Christ. Now, he's saying here, that is with Jews, what I did was put myself in the position of a Jew in order to win the Jews. Spiritually, right? He's saying physically I put myself in this position that I can win them spiritually for the Lord, that they would put their faith in Jesus Christ. With people in subjection to a legalistic perversion of the Torah, I put myself in the position of someone under such legalism in order to win those under this legalism. Even though I myself am not in subjection to a legalistic perversion of the Torah. And now some of y'all are saying, what, what do you mean legalistic perversion? Remember, I told you earlier that those people who, uh, who declare that if you don't eat, if you're eating pork or you're eating fish or they see something in the word, uh, the people who believe that, that um, Christians had to be circumcised, new Christians had to be circumcised, and, and uh, these people who, their pendulum has swung so far to the right that everything, you know, everything becomes a damnable sin. Everything, and not just the things that, that, that the Bible says is damnable sins, but they, they've gone out their way to make everything wrong, <laughs> everything bad. You know, you got to live in fear and all that kind of stuff. That's what the legalistic perversion is. And it's easy to happen. It, it can happen so easily if we don't stay in our word. That's why we need to study the word. It can happen very easily because you can start out wanting to please God. 
And you know that, that the Lord wants us to turn away from certain things. But then we can, we can run instead of, instead of letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide us how to do it. We try to run on our own understanding and wind up being so far out there, you know. Um, for example, there was this lady that she was, she was online and, and she, she was even collecting money, which is something false. But for, she was trying to collect money. To, to show people how how uh, certain soda cans and bottles have demonic symbols in it and all this other kind of stuff. And you can't, don't buy this over here and don't do this over there. Don't do that. Uh, you know, uh, certain pampers, they're, they're Satan worshipers and, and this, this, that, and the other. And you should not support them and all that stuff financially and all that, you know, going into that, so far into that, and then not concentrating on the things that really do get you locked out of heaven, like turning away from homosexuality, like turning away from, from, um, occults and everything like that. You know, the, the simple things that, that, that we see in, in Revelation chapter uh, 22 verse 15, or that we see in other parts of the scripture that God plainly tells us not to get involved in that and that we should pray about that and not get involved. But you know, that in a sense of what I'm saying, your pendulum has swung so far to the right, you're not staying on the straight and narrow, and and it's not a love of God that, that's being showed, it's like an obsession. You know, there's an obsession where these people want to be monks. It's okay if they want to do that, but to go and condemn, like it says in Romans 14, to go and condemn people who don't want, want to live that kind of a life for the Lord is also wrong. So I can't condemn people because they want to eat pork or something like that. I can pray for them because I know it's not good for the, the health, you know, or shellfish. I know it's not good for your health. Pray for you. Pray for myself. Try to get off of it, you know. Uh, let that be a struggle for me or for, for a lot of people who we grew up on it. Um, when that pray, we can do better. But I know that, that the act of eating unkosher food is not going to cause somebody to get thrown into to, to the depths of hell. It's not going to condemn somebody because they ate it. You know? Now, if you stop eating it, it'll make you you have better health. You will, because that's why God put it in His Word. You know? That's why God put it in His Word. I'm not telling you not to or give you, trying to get, say you have an excuse not to, not to eat kosher food. It would be better for you to eat kosher food. But I have understanding. God, the Lord gave me understanding. When you no nobody that's been eating that all their life is gonna, unless by miracle, is gonna just all of a sudden just cold turkey turn away from everything that they've been, everything that's unhealthy for them that they've been eating for a long time. That's something to pray about. Pray for one another about. Right. So anyway, so he says here. Um, with people in subjection to legalism, I put myself in a position of someone legalism. These are perversion of the Torah. Verse 21. With those who live outside the framework of the Torah, the Gentiles, the non-Christians, or the non-Jews, or the non-Christians, whatever, I put myself in the position of someone outside the Torah in order to win those outside the Torah. Although I myself am not outside the framework of God's Torah, but within the framework of the Torah as upheld by the Messiah, or by Jesus, right? With the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. With all kinds of people, I have become all kinds of things so that in all kinds of circumstances, I might save at least some of them, right? Right? But I do it all because of the rewards promised by the good news so that I may share in them along with the others who come to trust. Do not, or, or excuse me, don't you know that in a race all the runners compete but only one wins the prize, right? So then run to win. Live for Jesus to win, basically. Now, every athlete in training submits himself to strict discipline and he does it, does it to win a laurel wreath that will sooner, soon wither away. 
Here it comes in continuously for the rest of your life. Study your word. Pray. Show yourself approved. Don't just read the Bible once and then put it down and say, I'll get back to it later. No, you have to do it just like an athlete. They don't exercise once, win the championship, and then stop exercising. And then go back out there and try to fight again after having have not they have to keep themselves in shape. As long as they're trying to do to accomplish it, they have to stay in shape. Right? In order to in order to accomplish a goal. Yeah, I know it's easier said than done, but we have to try to try to stay in shape. We can't get lackadaisy. Right? Now, in every athlete in training submits himself to strict discipline, and he does to win the laurel wreath that wither away. But we do it to win a crown from God that will last forever. Accordingly, I do not run aimlessly, but straight for the finish line. I do not shadow box. I do not shadow box, but try to make every punch count. I treat my body hard and make it a slave so that after proclaiming the good news to others, after preaching to other people about obedience unto God, I myself will not be disqualified. That means after preaching, preaching to people, it's, it's plain, that's obvious. After preaching to people that they need to repent and turn away from sin, I need to return, repent and turn away from my own. They've been telling everybody else to turn away from their sins, but I'm not turning away from mine. They'll go to heaven, but I won't. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so I got to keep myself, i.e., which is why we read Psalm 51. After, after I, I, um, we go into Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 now, uh, we, we're going to end, of course. I always try to end by reading Psalm 51, and I call it our repentance prayer. That's so that I, myself, and you, we, we're reading it together, but what, would we, what are we reading it for? We're reading it so that if there's any, anything that I've done that I know I did wrong, I'm repenting and asking God to forgive me for it. Anything that I didn't even realize I did during my day or during the, during the day, I'm reading it, asking God, hey, Lord, um, those things that I, that I didn't even know that I've done, I'm ready and willing to repent from it so that I can stay righteous before you. you know. And on that note, so I know when people, when people I hear people say things about me, uh, uh, he thinks he's better than everybody else. He thinks he's doing this, that, and the other. I know for one, y'all haven't been listening to my my podcast or you didn't listen to all the way to the end because I always try to read Romans chapter, I mean, Psalm 51 for us to, to remember, to stay humble and remember we are all born again, works in progress. I say that through all my sermons. So even if I'm preaching, if I'm preaching out of the, out of the Bible and you're being cut to the heart, I want to let you know right now, that's not me. That's not Daryl. That's the Holy Spirit touching you, letting you realize, hey, this is something you need to come go to Jesus about, repent about, and stop doing. This is something that you, as an individual, you, between your relationship with Christ, when you feel cut to the heart like that, when you feel that pressure, or like how you say, Elizabeth, you say, when I preach, when, for some reason when I preach, it scares you. Well, it shouldn't scare you, but, but it should alert you. That's not, that's not Daryl. That's the Holy Spirit touching you, telling you something that you need to be paying attention to for your relationship with Christ, for your, your personal growth. That's not me. And for those, I said that for, even though I said Elizabeth, those of you out there, some, some of you others out there might be feeling the same thing. I, I pray that you, you are because what I want you to have a stronger relationship with Christ. So that's not a bad thing to feel that way. That's a good thing. That's the spirit letting you know, you know, where you need to grow at spiritually. Right? And then I know that also 
like I said, I know that because we live in the age of terrorism and all that kind of stuff, we have some uh, FCC, FBI, CIA people. There are people, their job <laughs> is to listen to broadcasts and things that of that nature. They're not going to tell, of course, the FBI and all them people in the FCC, they're not going to come out and say, we have people listening. But it doesn't take a rocket science to know that you have people listening, you know, and those people too, they're human beings. It could be a bot. It could be a programmed robot, but the, the robot is programmed to, to end it, alert human beings that something is being said or broadcasted that might be on the verge of, of some type of terrorism or something like that. So I know that ultimately there are some human beings listening and you might have that type of job. But at this point in time, you might not be a believer in Christ. Or you might be a believer in Christ, but no one ever pointed out to you, or may, at this point in time, no one ever pointed out to you these things that I'm preaching about. Now, I say that because I don't want you running and condemning people or, or calling other people hypocrites. You know, God gives them to preach what God gives them to preach, God gives me to preach what he gives me to preach. Okay? So, um, so I don't want y'all running and doing that. But, but the thing is, for those of you who are in that position, you know, it's a blessing that you can come to hear this because through your job and through having to listen to this, may you be blessed. May, may the Holy Spirit have, have touched on something that you needed to hear, whoever you are, right? Okay, now, chapter 10, verse uh, 1. For brothers, I do not want you to miss the significance of what happened to our fathers, meaning our ancestors, in a sense, right? Our forefathers. All of them were guided by a pillar of cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They saw the miracles of God. That's what he's telling you. They saw the miracles. And in connection with the cloud and with the sea, they all immersed themselves into Moses, into Moshe. Also, they all ate the same food from the spirit. He's talking about the manna and the quail that came from the sky. God got you, see? If you, don't, if you can't believe that that really happened, that really happened, you can't believe that really happened, then that shows where your faith in God's promises is. Right? They all ate from the Spirit, and they all drank the same drink from the Spirit. For they drank from the Spirit sent rock, water flowed out of a rock for them to drink, which followed them, and that rock was the Messiah, was Jesus. Yet, with the majority of them, God was not pleased. So their bodies were strewn across the desert. And you're going to have to read Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all those chapters, and, and Joshua. Study those chapters to see what he's talking about, right? How the Israelites, after everything that God did for them, they still didn't have the right amount of faith that God would take care of them. They still thought God wasn't, was going to drop them or, or leave them and that, that they should, should go ahead and try to fend for themselves because God was not really going to be there for them. Lack of faith, that's what that's called. So God was not pleased, so their body was strewn across the desert. God was not pleased with this, their great lack of faith. Now, verse 6, Now these things took place as a prefigurative historical events warning us not to set our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As the Tanakh puts it, the people sat down to eat and drink, then got up to indulge in reverie. Verse 8, And let us not engage in sexual immorality, he says it again, as some of them did, with the consequence that 
23,000 died in a single day because of sexual immorality of any kind. Right? And let us not put the Messiah to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. That's in Numbers. The book of Numbers. And do not grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroying angels. Stop complaining because things don't seem to be working out in your favor. God knows what he's doing. That's what he's saying there. These things happen to them as prefigurative historical events. And they were written down as a warning. As a warning to us. Who are living in the Akarit Hayamin. That's the present age, right? Therefore. Let anyone who thinks he is standing up. Be careful not to fall. Exclamation point. No temptation. Get this. Stop making up all those lame excuses. Stop saying to yourself or letting people tell you, uh, you ain't going, ladies, you ain't going to find no man going willing to wait uh, until y'all get married before y'all have sex. So you might as well go ahead and have sex anyway before you're married and disobey God and all that kind of stuff. Men, stop telling yourselves you need to, you can't trust this woman unless she let you have sex with her before you get married. Being disobedient unto God. And whatever else you convince yourself about. People all together. All the pornography and everything else out there. Any kind of sin. Homosexuality. Whatever. Listen up. No temptation has seized you beyond what people normally experience. And God can be trusted not to allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. On the contrary, along with the temptation, he will also provide a way out so that you will be able to endure. Endurance. And because of that, that's just one more, just as one more place. Stop making up these excuses and telling yourself, well, other people over there ain't nobody gonna gonna obey God like that. This is this is the Bible, but this is the real world over here, as if God is not real. Because he just told us, no temptation has seized you beyond what people, all people of all ages, normally experience. So you are not alone in your temptations and your experiences. We all have to remember not to let our temptations lead us into being disobedient. We have to fight to stay on that. If, if I got to fight to stay on that narrow road, I need to fight to stay on that narrow road. You're on the battlefield. You're a soldier in the army of the Lord. Now, if you're on the battlefield, obviously you're going to have some battles. You know, what are you on the battlefield for if you, if you don't think you're going to have some, some struggles and some battles and some confrontations inside and outside? Inwardly and outwardly. Confrontation. It's going to be there. He says for verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, run from idolatry. I speak to you as sensible people. Judge for yourselves. See, the word judge does not mean condemn. You know, when the English word judge can be used, it has double meaning. It can mean condemn. All right. But it also means make a decision, make a wise decision. It doesn't only mean condemn. So you got to be, be careful about that, too. People hear the word in Matthew chapter seven. Do not judge lest you be be judged in the same way. He's saying there Jesus is using it as condemn. Do not condemn lest you be condemned in the same way or less for the same reasons. But then even in, in that chapter, later on, the word judgment is not condemn, condemnation. He says judgment in, in other places in that same chapter. That's the way it was translated in English. 
but that's not the same meaning throughout all. You hear that word? Some people hear that word judgment, and y'all don't know it has more than one meaning to it. And right away, automatically, you put up the, the defenses. Somebody, you, you're trying to condemn me. No, not, not necessarily. You need to go back to school and learn proper English because you didn't, you didn't understand that, you know, the word judge has more than one meaning and can be used in different ways. All right. So anyway, he says, judge for yourselves what I'm saying. The cup of blessing over which we make the bracha, isn't it a sharing in the body of the sacrificial death of the Messiah, breaking of the bread and, and drinking of the wine, right? The bread we break, isn't it a sharing of the body of the Messiah? Verse 17, because there is one loaf of bread, we who are many constitute one body. There's only one Savior. Since we all partake of the one loaf of bread, we all acknowledge that Jesus is the only Savior. There are no other Saviors. Right? Of bread. Then he says in verse 18, Look at physical Israel. Don't those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? So what am I saying? Question. That food sacrificed to idols, oh, what am I saying? That food sacrificed to idols has any significance in itself? That's another question. Or that an idol has significance in itself? No. What I am saying is that the things which pagans sacrifice, pagans, people who do not, hey, Buck, welcome. People who do not believe that Jesus is the Savior, that's who pagan is, right? Back then, the pagan was people who were not Jews. that believed in other gods besides God Almighty, right? He says here, uh, I am saying that people which pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice not to God, but to demons. Here we go again. How many people that say they're Christians, but then they say demons don't exist? Yes, they do. <laughs> Jesus, did Jesus chase demons out of people? Yes, he did. Are demons still around today? Yes, they are. You know what? A lot of times, like when these people do things, we hear on the news right now. Why did this person didn't seem to have the, the, the last one? I think it was Alaska Airlines. He stole an airplane. And everybody's like, why did he do something like that? He, we, we see him as to be a normal person, this, this, that, and the other. He never saw, showed any signs. Or why did that man shoot from that hotel room? Or why did the other guy shoot up at the... Why do these people do these things? You know? Because they're demon-possessed. And I know you scientists and everybody that don't believe in Jesus, really believe in Jesus Christ, will sit there and say, Oh, no, no, it's got to be some scientific reason. How come y'all ain't found out the reason yet? The reason why y'all ain't found out the reason is because you don't want to admit... There are people out there that are demon-possessed. <laughs> Why you don't want to admit that, I don't know. I mean, you know, one thing we need to be praying for is people, uh, brothers and sisters, we need to ask God to give us the, the, uh, the gift of exorcism, to exorcise some of these demons out in the name of Jesus Christ, right? We need to do something like that. Demons exist. Okay, but we don't have to sit there and go, demons exist and like Hollywood have us running around scared and trying to, you know, when, we, when I say exorcism, running around trying to, you know, do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, a lot of times Satan doesn't, doesn't present himself that way. That's theatrics. Satan presents himself on the sly. People, these people, you know, we say, well, they had a mental illness. You know, okay, well... That may be true. You might be able to see some things, but we we know that Jesus and and he commissioned the apostles to go chase demons out. We know Paul chased the demon out of, uh, and the other apostles, Peter and all of them, cast demons out of people in the name of Jesus Christ. So they they are real. They're not just contained in the in the Holy Bible and and they suddenly went away somewhere. Demonic spirits are around to this very day, and they will be around until Christ returns. And we need to pray for the gift of casting those demons out. 
Anyway, so let me go ahead and say, say demons. And I don't want you to become sharers of demons. The Apostle Paul is telling we demons exist. All right? You cannot drink both a cup of the Lord and a cup of demons. You cannot partake in both a meal of the Lord and a meal of demons. And what I say to you is that those, those of you who are Christians and you're saying, um, well, other religions out there is, deserve respect and all that kind of stuff. Those other religions out there in the world, if it ain't Jesus Christ, if it ain't Jesus Christ, they are demonic spirits, which people are still to this day worshiping, trying to prove that their particular religion is the same as, as Christ, right? Christ dying for us. No, those are demonic spirits. They came before Jesus Christ came and, they, and, they, and they're here after. You know, they've, they've been around. So, be careful about that. Don't go around saying other religions uh, have equal standing. And and I don't care if, if, if uh, this government or society wants you to say that. If you really know, if you really fear the Lord, and if you really know that Jesus is alive, don't say it. Don't give in to that. I mean, I, all I'm just saying is, I'm, I'm telling you, I wouldn't give in to that. I'd rather you kill me than to, for me to say that there is some other Savior out there besides Jesus Christ, because there's not. All right? And then for those of you, for my brothers, the reason why I took my DNA test, you know, now, those of you brothers and sisters out there who want to declare that salvation has something to do with ethnicity, ethnicity excuse me, Yes, there's just as many sons of Japhtha out there saying that you have to be a son of Japhtha in order to be saved. And sons of Ham or children of Ham. There's a bunch of you saying, well, you need to be following Egyptian gods or, or black gods and goddesses. And then Semites. Many of you saying the same thing. But I'm so thankful that, that reading the word, according to the word of God, salvation has nothing to do with your DNA ethnicity ain't got nothing to do with how African you are, how European you are, or how Semite you are. I'm going to say Semite because Semite, you know, that covers Asian, Native American, and everybody else. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. God is not looking at that. God is not looking at that. He's looking at it if we have uh, acknowledged the stone that the builders rejected, which is Jesus Christ. He's looking at whether we have acknowledged that he is the only savior and that we need him. Okay, so now let me read uh, verse 22. Okay, well, I'll go back to 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and a cup of demons. You cannot partake in both a meal of the Lord and a meal of demons. Verse 22. Or are we trying to make the Lord jealous? We aren't, we are not stronger than he is, are we? Verse 23. Everything is permitted, you say? Now, that's a question in my book. Everything is permitted, you say? That means I can do whatever I want to do. That's what, that's what we like to say. We Human beings, I can do whatever I want. Hey, welcome, Jeshwana. I can do whatever I want. Well, the Paul said, Paul says here, maybe that might be true in a sense, but not everything is helpful. And then he says again, we like to say everything is permitted. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm free. I can do whatever I want to do. Maybe, maybe that's true, right? But not everything is edifying. No one should be looking out for his own interests, but of his fellow. Now, we talked about that before. You know, we shouldn't be selfishly saying, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I don't care how it, it negatively affects a younger Christian, this, this, that, and the other. He, he needs to, or she needs to grow up in the Lord, and I'm going to go ahead and do whatever I want to do anyway. You know, that's being selfish. That's not being loving. 
That's not being kind. Right? We want to talk about kindness of the spirit, uh, teaching about being kind and loving. Well, we, we got to stop being selfish Christians. In a sense, we all have to. We all have to repent about that because it's easy to do. Those of us seasoned Christians, it is easy. A lot of times, I think it's easier for us to get selfish in our Christianity than, than for a new Christian to get selfish in his Christian or her Christianity. It's easy to fall into, and it's something that we need to repent about, right? He says here, uh, but for those of his fellow, verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, right? Eat whatever is put in front of you without raising questions of conscience. Now, when, back when I was in California and, and I was in the Navy, uh, and uh, also in, in, the, in the Church of Christ back there, you know, there was people in California, there's brothers and sisters Christians from all parts of the world. And one of the good things is that I learned so much. When you go to their home uh, uh, and they prepare you a meal, they're going to prepare you a meal based on what they culturally eat over in, in those other countries. And, uh, or the, the way they prepare it. It's based on what their, what their culture says, how they should eat, how they should drink. Um, uh, and, or, or even if they came from poverty in those other countries, they still have a culture about, about the way they eat. One experience I, I, I tell you from, from my back in my days, I um, met this young lady. Her name was Vilai. I don't even know where Vilai is right now. Her name was Vilai, and she was from Laos. She was the first person that I personally met from Laos. And uh, long story short, you know, I was younger back then, single. I went to her house, you know, or, or I got invited to her house. I met her in school. I met her in uh, Laney College. Laney uh, Peralta College is down there in Oakland, California. Um, so anyway, we became friends, and then she, uh, she invited me to her house. And most of the people in her house did did not speak English, but just a few people spoke English. And it was customary in their house, I'm going to make it short, it was customary in their house to um, take banana leaves and wrap the food in banana leaves. Not only that, they had banana leaves where they wrapped food in, um, and they had a big bowl of rice sitting in the center. And they did not have, at that time, any uh, utensils. There were some Americanized family members in the house but since I was invited to their house, I didn't think about it. We sat down, and not only that, they put mats on the... You sat down cross-legged on the floor. You know, like, like in Japan, you sit and they have these little short tables. But in this particular young lady's house, the people, after they cooked a meal and want to share a meal, you sat down in a circle on the floor. Right? So... Um, that was the traditional way they did it. And, and she understood, and they understood too. They said, you might not be accustomed to this, but of course, I'm in your house. I'm not going to tell you how to eat or anything. But that wasn't the only thing. Um, I was looking for, after they, they did whatever they did, I was looking for the utensils. Now, this young lady's mother, she was not a Christian. She's not a Christian. She was Buddhist. Um, the, the young lady's mother was the one that, that, that traditionally is supposed to feed everybody. And... I didn't know this until then. What happened was she reached in with her, her bare hands into the bowl of rice. You know, the meat was wrapped in the banana, was already on your plate, was wrapped in like the meat and everything like that, was wrapped in the banana leaf. But the rice was, uh, was in the bowl in the middle. She reached in with her bare hand and took, took a chunk of rice and put it in there, everybody's, including my plate, you know? Now, of course, me not being used to that, you know, the people who uh, were Americanized, they said, do you have a problem with this, <laughs> eating this way? And I said, no, I understood, I knew. I, I immediately thought about what Paul said here, you know. I knew at that time that, you know, 
I was understanding that you know everybody doesn't do everything like like what I, how I was brought up. So therefore, you don't look at it with disdain and don't don't be prejudgmental. That's where Jesus was talking about. Don't be judgmental. The same measure you use against against other people, they might use against you. They might think it's, it's crazy that you sit at a table and, and eat with spoons and forks as compared to what they were doing, right? That's nothing condemnable about that. That's nothing. So I ate, you know, long story short. So I ate I mean, I learned and I didn't like say, say to myself, I'll never go back to their house or anything like that. No, I didn't. I went back to the house and visited again. That was my friend. But, you know, but this is what some of the things that that's, that's what it's saying to me. It might be saying something different to you, this scripture, but that's what it's saying to me. Right. So if uh, without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this meat was offered as a sacrifice, someone sees you and says, hey, don't eat that meat. It was offered as a sacrifice. That's different now because that person is saying that because they're Christian. And I already know they might be new Christian. They're not a seasoned Christian. OK, they might be spiritually weak at this moment. And if I continue to eat, I'm acting selfishly and I'm not considerate about uh, that brother or sister's uh, relationship with Christ and well-being right so that's what Paul says right here that's what Paul's saying right here you know it, but if someone says to you this meat was uh, offered as a sacrifice then don't eat it then what does he say here out of consideration for the person who pointed it out not because I think it's going to do anything to me but because that brother or sister has a problem with me doing this out of consideration for their salvation, their continued relationship with God, their continued spiritual growth, not my own. I know it ain't going to do nothing to me. I know I'm not disobeying God, but because that other person believes so, it is, it is loving and kind to say, okay, I can't eat it. And then the, the people who, if they might be offended, but they're not Christians, if they got get offended, they have to understand, you know what? When it comes to salvation, I'm being respectable. But when it comes to my brother and sister's salvation, if they have a problem, I can't do it. You know, that's being obedient to my Savior, right? And loving to my brother or sister. You know, you can't please everybody. And it ain't about pleasing people. But, but I want to make sure that my brother and sister don't stumble in their faith. Right? As Pastor Paul says here. Right? Okay, so, um, all right, for his conscience sakes, uh, verse 29, however, I don't mean your conscience, but that of the other person. You say, and then he, here he goes again, we like to say, and this question, why should my freedom be determined by somebody else's conscience? That's a selfish question right there. We're talking about being selfish, right? Why should I be concerned about that other brother? I know I ain't doing nothing wrong, so I'm going to go ahead and eat. That's, that, that, that's being selfish. <laughs> I mean, even to say it, that's being selfish. We got to admit, that's being selfish. All right? He says, so, so um, why am I criticized over something for which I myself bless God? Well, Whatever you do, whether it is eating or drinking or anything else, right? Do it all so as to bring glory to God. Do not be an obstacle to anyone, not to Jews, not to Gentiles, and not to God's messianic, commun messianic community. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not looking out for my own interests, but for those of the many, so that they may be saved. It's about their salvation. You're not being people pleasing. I don't care what people think. If 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 Paul is saying he don't care what people think about about him, his concern is that the brother or sister who has been saved or is about to be saved needs to needs not to have any obstacles in in their way toward them being saved and having eternal life with Christ. And if I have to 
sacrifice my own pleasure, you know, in eating or drinking or doing something like that. I would rather, he's telling us, we should rather do, uh, abstain from doing what we enjoy if it means that a brother or sister uh, will stay faithful unto Christ and will not be confused about their own salvation or their own walk. That's what he's talking about right, right here. Now, that's the end of chapter 10. I am going to read, it's 7 o'clock now, I'm going to, we're going to go to Psalm 51. And we're going to repent. We're going to think about what we just read. You know, think about what, what you just read. If, if in your own past, recently or presently, some of the things that we just read about, about being selfish and not, not really being considerate about a new brother and sister in the faith, or, um, or if you thought, if you thought like, like, like many people think that Christians are not supposed to be making money off the gospel, <laughs> or, or something like that, or um, uh, not making their living off the gospel. And before I even get to 51, what I, what I did want to say is that, yes, we can make our living off the gospel, but we need to be careful. You know, there's a big difference, and you got to be honest, there's a big difference between um, making a decent living, having a roof over your head as a preacher or pastor, having a roof over your head, nice, you know, decent clothes, not $500 suits, and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a difference. You don't necessarily have to have to do that and for the sake of those people who are Christian and are lo looking at this and saying that pastor or whatever is just trying to take my money and all that be considerate you don't have to be people pleasing but be considerate about their their weak as, as it says in the Bible weak faith yes it's okay to make a living but is it, is it really okay to be asking people to, to pay for your airplane and all that kind of stuff Pay for pay for these big your yacht and so that you be riding around in the Bentley and all that kind of stuff. That's something you need to pray about. I th I just think I'm I'm not saying that Christians have to stay poor and in poverty or pastors. I'm not saying that either. But you got to be ask God for wisdom about about how luxurious or how luxurious your lifestyle is. You know. Ask God for wisdom about that. And then also have understanding that people who say that those things may be weak in the faith. You know, they see you with anything. And they think that you need to be poor in power. They might be weak in the faith. So we need to pray and learn how to forgive one another and, and then come to a, an understanding about that. It's okay to have wealth. It's okay to preach as we said earlier in here, that's government. That's giving to Caesar, whether you're for profit or non profit. That's giving to Caesar. That has nothing to do with your relationship with God. There is no scripture in the Bible that says, that contradicts what Paul says. There's no scripture in the Bible that says, because you are a preacher or a minister, you have to file for non profit status. That, that has nothing to do <laughs> with it. You can be for profit or non profit. You just have to know, educate yourself on what the rules are when it comes time to pay your taxes. Okay? Educate yourself on what the rules are. Of course, you have Enron and then you have corrupt people under nonprofit doing things, violating their nonprofit status for money. That's a temptation that everybody has to watch out for, regardless of what your status is. You know, that's what we need to be praying about for one another. Okay, so then of course uh, the next the next uh, sermon I do is going to be on First Corinthians eleven, probably eleven by itself. I may try to get eleven and twelve in there, but we'll, I'll, I'll have to go over it again and look into it. First uh, Corinthians eleven. So anyway, um, I'm at I'm getting to Psalm fifty one right now, so we can end this. Thank you for showing up, uh, Sister Watt, Sister Lee. Uh, how's Brother Lee doing? I need to give him a phone call. How's, how's things going with that? Um, I'll give him a phone call maybe maybe tomorrow. I got some other things I need to do. I'll try to call him tomorrow, okay? Sister Lee? All right. 
Uh, oh, and congratulations also on on, on I saw the, the um, on Facebook. I'm gonna say congratulations. I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but on your or being ordained or something like that. Congratulations. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's see. Let's start reading Psalm 51. And uh, in your books, verse one might start at my book, verse three. All right. So that means uh, my, my first two verses says, "For the leader, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after his affair with Bathsheba." Now remember, we're reading this psalm asking God for forgiveness for, for what we've done. Not so that we can point fingers at King David, okay, for what he did. But anyway, let's start. It says, God, in your grace, have mercy on me. In your great compassion, blot out my crimes. Wash me completely from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my crimes. My sin confronts me all the time. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil from your perspective so that you are right in accusing me and justified in passing sentence. True, I was born guilty, was a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. Still, you want truth in the inner person. So make me know wisdom in my inmost heart. Straighten me up on the inside. That's what David is saying. Right? My spirit up. He says, sprinkle me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sound of joy and gladness so that the bones you crush can rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out my crimes. Though they may be many, right? Please turn your face away from the Lord. Create in me a clean heart. God, renew in me a resolute spirit. Do not thrust me away from your presence. Do not take your Rach HaKodesh away from me. That's the Holy Spirit. Restore my joy in your salvation. And let a willing spirit uphold me. Then I will teach the wicked your ways and sinners will return to you. No, we are not to go hide in the corner just because we did something wrong. We are supposed to go out because God forgave us. We are supposed to go out and preach and teach all the more and testify all the more. Because we, he forgave us for the things we've done. Right? It says, rescue me from the guilt of shedding blood. From the guilt of murder. God, God of my salvation, then my tongue will sing about your righteousness. Right? Adonai, that means the Lord, open my lips, then my mouth will praise you. Now, listen carefully to this last part again. For you do not want sacrifices or I would give them. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Today in the Christian church, we praise the Lord. We go down and worship in, in our homes, in the, in the church. We praise the Lord. We pray. We lift the name of Jesus Christ up, right? We don't sacrifice animals. We sacrifice to the Lord too. We do that. We praise and sacrifice unto the Lord in, in a different way. We give him praises. You know, we try to live the life. He says, you do not want sacrifices or I would give them. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Why is David saying you do not want? What he's saying is, if I'm still living in sin and I have not repented from my sins, from doing things, if I'm still selfishly going out there sinning, deliberately sinning, and then going to church and praising you and lifting you up and all that kind of stuff, my praise is not accepted. Because why? Because I have not turned away from my sins. Or anybody else. Your praise is not accepted by God. You want your praise to be acceptable unto God, so therefore it's necessary to repent. Turn away from what the Holy Bible says is sin in God's eyes. 
no matter what that sin may be. Right? Then David says here, my sacrifice to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not spurn a chastened heart or chastened heart, right? In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, now that we've been forgiven, now that we've repented and we've been forgiven, then David says, then and only then will you delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole offerings, and whole burnt offering, excuse me, then they will offer bulls on your altar. In other sense, after we've repented and been forgiven, then God will accept our praise. That's why we, you know, I'm, I'm a ministry of repentance. You can't take back what you, reason why we read Psalm 51 also, you can't take back what you've done. If you've done something wrong, you've done it wrong. We can't go back in time. We need Jesus. We need to ask Jesus to fix it, right? Fix it. Forgive us. We repent for what we've done, what we said or did that was out of, out of line with your word. Now, forgive us and let us praise you and fix it. And our faith is that he fixed us. Our faith is that he's forgiven us when we repent. See, that's what a, a lot of the, the, the difference with a lot of people is we, a lot of us think we have a green light because Jesus died on the cross for us. We have a green light to go do whatever, whatever, and just assume without ever getting on our knees and without ever saying, Lord, I'm sorry. We just assume and don't even ask for forgiveness that God going to forgive us. He died on the cross and we just keep going about our merry way, never asking for forgiveness. Never asking the Lord to forgive us. And, and what y'all need to remember in, in Ezekiel chapter 33, it says there, if a righteous person starts acting wickedly, all of your past righteousness will be forgotten. Okay? It's the same God. He will not, God will not remember your former righteousness if you start going back into living your sinful lifestyle again. Lest you repent. When we look at Revelations chapter chapter uh, one, Revelation chapter one, two, and three, the main thing that Jesus kept saying to the churches, I know your deeds. I see the good things that you have done, but I still have this against you. And what is the solution? Every time he says he has something against Christians or people who are being Christian or living the Christian lifestyle, is that you have not repented from this particular type of activity and you are letting the, the young people in your church think that it's okay to disobey me this way repent if you do not repent from this I'm going to take your candlestick away isn't that what it says in Revelation chapter you know throughout the whole Bible the one thing God does not does not condemn us for committing acts of sin he condemns us if any of us are going to be condemned, it's because we won't repent. We won't stop doing it. And we think those of us who are Christian first, we're not talking about people in the world who don't believe Christ. Those of us who believe Christ is the Savior. The one thing he, he have a concern about is us saying we Christians, but not repenting from our sins. Or not even, even this, we know you struggle with it, not even asking for forgiveness. And saying things like, yeah, I know we have a thorn. But saying things to young people, I know we have a thorn. Uh, but it's okay for you to go off and indulge in, in this sin because, you know, God is, doesn't expect you to be perfect, so it's okay. It's not okay. To, no sin is okay to continue living in. Okay? No sin is okay. Those things that we still wind up doing, we need to be pray in prayer about. We need to be on our knees asking God to forgive us for those things that we, we, we find ourselves doing. We need to be patiently waiting for him, the Holy Spirit, to wash those things out of our heart. But if that has not happened yet, no, you do not have a green light to go and indulge in the sins and say stuff like, well, God ain't washed it away from me, so I guess he don't have a problem with it. Yes, he still, still does have a problem with it, <laughs> okay? He does have a problem with it, all right? Um, 
And it is our responsibility. Yes, I have faith that move mountains, but we still have personal responsibility to refrain. We have personal responsibility. We just read that no temptation is, is given a, a, a to, toward you or me that other people haven't faced. And God will always give you a way out. So let's stop. Let's stop. Especially my, my uh, brothers and sisters of color. Let's stop with these excuses as why we can't, we just can't refrain from, from participating in things that we know the Holy Bible says we should not be participating in. Let's do our best. We know Satan is out there going to try to throw it in your face. Try to get you to come back. You know, you can't see what's around the corner. Sometimes Satan is work, waiting right around the corner to throw something at you. That, you know, that he knows in your past life or before you started walking on this on this road to salvation or, or righteousness that, that used to entice you. Yes, he's going to have that waiting around the corner a lot of times. You're going to be caught off guard a lot of times. That's why, it, you know, it's so good to know we have a savior we can go to get on our knees. Sometimes you don't even realize you don't fell back into doing something that you what you said you told God you wasn't going to do anymore until you were like halfway into it. And then you got to remember, you know, but when that when that conscious that 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 spirit comes and says, hey, you told me you wasn't going to do this. Or you told me. You told you told the Holy Spirit you wasn't going to do this. Now here you are doing it again. That's the time where you when you realize that you got to sit down and get on your knees and ask the Lord for forgiveness and and then get away from whatever it is that you were doing that you know you're not supposed to be doing. Okay, you know, so nobody's perfect. We I I don't call anybody to be perfect uh, or preaching anybody to be perfect or anything like that. We all need Jesus. I'm still sick. I keep telling y'all I'm still sick. Jesus said, is the sick that need the doctor, not the healthy? I'm still sick. I'm going to be sick until the day I die, spiritually sick in need of Jesus until the day I die. And so are you, <laughs> all of you, right? Okay. So I'm going to pray out. Uh, well, I got to go to work tonight, but I will try it out. I'll, I'll see if I can get in to do, um, do one on Google for the Google people. Um, it's going to be different from this one. Uh, it's not going to be uh, first Corinthians. It's going to be something different. All right, so um, Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you. We come to you right now, sweet name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us this time, this opportunity um, to uh, to go into your word and learn something of value. I pray and ask you in the, Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ that, that we all got something good out of it, um, that we all can go through the, throughout the rest of our day and the rest of our lives knowing that we've gotten a good word, we've gotten a good message from you. This I pray and ask in Jesus' name. And before I go up, get off, please visit my website. I'm always changing things on it. Visit the website. Scroll down. I have a phone number. Um, I have an honors page. Sister, leave, uh, read the honors page. If you go on the website, you and brother, read the honors page and let me know if there's other people that I should give honor to um, on the page. Uh, or if it's, if it's good, good enough to give honor, there's an honor page. There's a link there for that. Um, there's a link for my videos, uh, down at the bottom. I have a forum also. And one person, Elizabeth just wrote on the forum. The forum is for, um, if you want me to pray for somebody, uh, if you want to bring up a topic, if you want, want to discuss about something, please leave a message in my, my forum. It's a public forum. It's down at the bottom of the page. You scroll uh, on the website. Now the website is designed right now. There are, aren't really many graven images. It's all text and a lot of links to different things. If y'all haven't read the website, so don't be, you know, don't be surprised if when you go to the website, it's just all these words and links. <laughs> I did that on purpose because, um, if you know anything about how computers load, load up websites, a website with a lot of graphics takes a longer time on some people's computers to load up, you know, but the links will go right away. So, so I intend to put graphics and everything on, on other pages, not on that first page. So I have a page that will have links to it, uh, photos, 
It'll be a photo gallery, you know, like the like old school websites. It'll have a photo gallery, videos. I have the video page up and things of that nature. You'll have to click to that link to get to that particular page. So that way, that way, um, you know, whatever computers uh, are out there, if another person wants to come to the website, they don't have to wait a long time. But when you go to that page with the videos and the pictures on it, you know, you'll click to that link yourself personally, and then, of course, those pages will take a little longer to load up. All right? So, um, God bless all of you. Thank you for listening. Whether you were listening on um, Spreaker.com, uh, whether you were listening on uh, Facebook here, and I, I hope and pray that uh, I will get some listeners or some video watchers. I mean, Spreaker.com already puts, puts it on Google, uh, this message on Google. But um, So I should say some people to watch the videos that I'm going to be putting up on Google Live uh, uh, or Google in, in general or on YouTube. All right? So God bless all of you, and thank you for listening. Have a blessed day. Rest of the evening.